The Romanov Foundation is, is pleased to present Romanovs in Music, a musical evening organized by Alexander Krepeev at the Pushkin House in London. It's a great program and the second in a series of musical evenings we've done on the Romanovs and their, their influence on music over the last several centuries. Um, the program is really fantastic and we hope you enjoyed as much as we did. Music have been written for Romanovs for during, during the past 300 years. I came across two huge volumes of music dedicated to them and written by them. Um, unfortunately, it's just impossible to play everything in one evening. So I, I chose the best I could find. First in the program, we're going to hear Polonaise by Beethoven. Princess Elizaveta Alexeyevna was wife of Alexander I. She came to Vienna in 1814 to support Alexander when he was visiting um, for, the, for the famous Congress, of course. Um, and there she's met Beethoven, who was obviously not a very social guy. Uh, but nevertheless, they became friends. And a mutual, a mutual friend suggested Beethoven write a piece for her in the hope that you know, she will um, repay with favors. Um, Beethoven was reluctant at first, and then he did. His, his Polonaise was published as number one of many. However, that's the only piece with that title, Beethoven did. A um, few years later, Princess Elizabeth, Elizabeth returned to Vienna for her birthday, and she's asked Beethoven to play. That was Beethoven's final appearance in public. A few years later, Beethoven dedicated his arrangement of the Seventh Symphony to her. So to me, that says quite a lot. Frankly, this dedication was the only dedication by Beethoven that ended up in a financial uh, reimbursement. So he only, um, not only he got money for that piece, he got twice as much for the three violin sonatas he wrote for Alexander, one of the sonatas we're going to hear at the end of the first half.
Ivan Laskovsky, a real discovery of mine uh, for a recent few months. Laskovsky was contemporary of Glinka. He wasn't taught professionally. He was a military officer. He was, I believe he took part in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in some military actions in, in his youth. And then uh, he became a fine composer. He was really famous in St. Petersburg. Apparently Liszt stayed in his house uh, and he was very much respected by Balakirev who published his complete works 50 years uh, in, in 1860s. And uh, Rubinstein also, Anton Rubinstein played some of his pieces. So he was known in Russia in 19th century, completely forgotten today. Um, a few dances that Daniel is going to play are dedicated to Empress Alexander Feodorovna, who is wife of Nicholas I. <laughs>
Franz Schubert, next composer in the program. He wrote two marches uh, published in two consecutive years. One commemorates the death of Alexander I. Another march, uh, the next half of the concert, is dedicated to a succession on the throne of Nicholas I.
my teens, really. And he's one of the most important composers, never really to get performed a great deal. And he's either the most Russian of the German composers or the most German of the Russian composers. He was born in a small town in Bavaria, um, Schwabach. His family shortly thereafter moved to Munich. And um, he ended up settling in St. Petersburg, where he was ennobled, became von Henselt, and was made the inspector of the Imperial Schools of Music. And as such, all of the piano teachers virtually who would follow with a generation or two later would have been through his system of teaching. So he can accurately be described really as the father of what we now call the Russian piano school. He was also fascinatingly the teacher of Rachmaninoff's teacher. And uh, one feature of Henzel's style is that it's massive. <laughs> he was um, obsessed with finger extension um, and he didn't like Schumann injure himself. Um, he just carried on getting longer and longer fingers to torment pianists for generations to come. Um, and that's fairly apparent in this, really, I have to say, absurdly over-the-top march, um, which I find, I find it quite hard to play with a straight face, but it's really great fun. <laughs> Alexandra Sofna, 
She's wife of uh, Duke Constantine, brother of Alexander II. W when they married, they got this beautiful palace on the right um, as the wedding present. <laughs> now, when, when, I, when I researched it, I actually imagined it like a, it was like a small Russian dacha, and, you know, very cozy and romantic. And then, <laughs> and then <laughs> what, what is actually remarkable is not only she invested lots of time into this palace, into this um, place, she cultivated gardens around it, and she taught um, locals about gardening. And I believe she also set up classes for local children. So she's really, really invested in this place. And the romance that I'm going to play, I, I, still does, I think it does confirm that it, it was a romantic place for her and her husband. cheerful it, and earned itself the nickname um, Champagne Sonata which hopefully you'll hear in the opening few bars um, why that was so. Um, it's not always called that these days. Um, that's life. The second movement um, is a gorgeous little minuet. It starts up the first section is just very beautiful, very simple and then the central section um, the violin has a very beautiful simple melody. At the same time in the piano um, you get an extraordinary thing where he puts massive great accents, Swartzando's in fact, um, in the left hand on all the wrong notes. <laughs> so what I had a violin teacher who said it was like someone who's walking along with a wooden leg who's slightly drunk but with one leg in the gutter. <laughs> and so it's a bit like that in the middle and that comes back through to the end of the, the movement. And then in the final movement, um, it's really fast and really, really fun. Um, and then it comes to an incredible incredible formata that he pauses in the middle of the section and there's such an extraordinary key change that nobody would ever write i mean just simply nobody would do it the first time i heard it i burst out laughing in Wigmore more hall um, and got shushed by people around me so please feel free to laugh it's really funny <laughs>
Next composer we have, Eduard Napravnik. Just like Hanselt, he wasn't born in Russia. He was Czech by birth, uh, but he had a prominent place in Russian musical uh, culture. He was close, close friends with Tchaikovsky, to whom um, the later dedicated his opera, The Maid of Orleans. Napravnik conducted premieres of Tchaikovsky's first concerto, uh, The Queen of Spades, Iolanta, and Prichnik. So he was a prominent champion of Tchaikovsky. Um, most importantly, Napravnik, as a conductor, managed to put the sim Pathetic Symphony, the Sixth Symphony, <coughs> properly um, on the map of you know, musical um, history. He conducted the second performance 12 days after Tchaikovsky's death um, because the actual premiere wasn't as convincing as his performance, you see, apparently. <laughs> Not to everyone, at least. So, um, interestingly, in, in, the, in the song that you're just about to hear, Napravnik quotes uh, f opening bars of the Eugene Onegin.
next composer was the author of the words we've just heard. Grand Duke Konstantin Konstantinovich was probably uh, the most talented in arts of all Romanovs. He was a composer, a poet, playwright, actor. He um, was the father of nine children. <laughs> <laughs> His mother was uh, Grand Duchess Alexandra Osifovna, whose Roman Strelna we've heard in the first half. So probably art was closely in that branch of Romanovs. Uh, the next two songs we're going to hear are dedicated to his sister, Olga Konstantinovna, <coughs> also daughter of Alexandra Osifovna. Olga was a wife of a Greek king for, I think, nearly 30 years. And at some point in 19... 20, 1921, she was the ruler of Greece for, for about a year. The, the songs are, I think they're just very pure, uh, perhaps naive. And the second one, he's, I think he's referring to famous Russian poet Lermontov, um, who wrote a poem about angel carrying a soul into the paradise. <laughs> Thank you. 
Anton Rubinstein um, was compared with Liszt, and rightly so, he was one of the greatest pianists of the 19th century, conductor and composer as well. His connection with Romanov was very interesting. At, at, the, age of, at the age of 20, he became, um, well, a protege of Grand Duchess Elena Pavlovna. She took him under her wing, uh, and quite literally, he started to live at one of the wings of, the, of one of her palaces. The, the, the collaboration resulted in um, 1859 by establishment, by the two of them, of the Russian Music Society, which led to establishment of the uh, St. Petersburg and Moscow conservatories and raised the standard of classical music in Russia immensely. So most of the principles Rubinstein set into, um, into musical education in Russia in the 70s are basically taught in Russia up to these days. The next two pieces we, we are going to hear, the two melodies are dedicated to Yelena Pavlovna. Thank you. 
was written by Tchaikovsky for a huge orchestra. It's the, the, the orchestra he discorded for is, is truly impressive. He was trying to impress, he, uh, and, you know, and he managed to succeed. A few years after this composition, commissioned by, um, well, it was, it was written for the occasion of the coronation, not for the actual day, but it was performed uh, at the celebrations within the following days. A uh, few years late after composing this, he, Tchaikovsky was granted um, unlimited rights for his stage, for his operas and ballets, for whatever he would write. It would be performed without, um, without discussions. It will be accepted by the imperial theaters. That's the artistic freedom Tchaikovsky got after composing this, basically.
often when you play a piece of music, you'll find at the start of it, there's a little bit like this on the sonata that we played this evening in the concert. Um, in this case, it says, Dem Kaiser Alexander der Erste von Russland gewidmet. So it was dedicated to um, Alexander I of Russia. I have to say, I have played this sonata hundreds of times in my life, and I'd never actually really taken on board that it was dedicated to Alexander I of Russia. Um, and it was actually really when um, Sasha got in touch to talk about this program that I suddenly realized that was the case. I was incredibly happy to be singing uh, composers that are not so well known, such as Napravnik, the family of Romanov, and uh, just to be able to uh, portray in this music that is not so well known and not so often performed, it makes it really, really special. I've always been a great lover of Russian music since um, early childhood. And one of the interesting things about Russian music is that it's a, a recent tradition compared to the rest of Europe. So it's relatively young. And there was a great flowering of the arts and culture in Russia with Catherine the Great. And this sort of supporting of the arts flourished um, with the generations to come. So it's really interesting when you do a program like this that is um, concerning some pieces of music that were written for a particular family. When you think about the relationship between the artists and the family, there was sort of an almost symbiosis. When you look at the friendships that um, existed between um, Oldenburg and Henselt, for example, and how they made music together, um, I think it's quite a special time in history. And for me, that's what's lovely about this particular concert. Um, well, when I was offered to organize this concert, I was a bit, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know there's actually that much music written for the Romanovs and by Romanovs. Um, in the course of research, I was overwhelmed with the amount of compositions and some of the names involved, Beethoven, Schubert, Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, Gretchenyanov, Glazunov, uh, the best of the best Russian composers wrote for Romanovs and dedicated their works to them. So today was just a wonderful opportunity to pay tribute to the Russian royal family. Uh, you know, being born in end of 20th century, we, you know, I didn't, we didn't know much about Romanovs. We didn't know their culture, what they did. So that was a beautiful, perfect chance to learn about this.